I welcome all of you to the video lecture series on computational fluid dynamics, development, application, and analysis. This lecture is on solution methodology on a uniform and non-uniform Cartesian grid, or both one-dimensional and two-dimensional unsteady heat conduction. This lecture corresponds to the chapter five of the companion book on computational heat conduction. This lecture is the last in the series of lecture for this chapter. We are into the part two of this lecture series, which corresponds to CFD for a Cartesian geometry, where we are taking both uniform and this uh, part is presented on uniform as well as non-uniform grid for uh, starting with unsteady heat conduction, then moving on to unsteady heat advection unsteady heat convection and finally unsteady fluid flow. After presenting the part, the second step of CFD development, which involves algebraic formulation. The algebraic formulation was presented in the previous lecture on physical law based finite volume method where algebraic formulation was a control volume based, where we have taken a control volume and applied physical laws, use discrete mathematics, use certain approximation, and finally obtain the uh, linear algebraic equation for an internal grid point, which, which was presented like as a yellow circle. Then using finite difference method, the algebraic formulation was presented for the boundary grid points, which was presented by the blue circle. So these two sections, 3.1 and 3.2, present the second step of CFD development corresponding to algebraic formulation. The first step on grid generation was presented while presenting the algebraic formulation for a uniform grid. And in today's lecture, the non-uniform grid generation will be introduced. And after the step two on algebraic formulation, the today's lecture is on the step three of CFD development. After the second step of CFD development, this lecture is on the step three corresponding to solution methodology, where the solution methodology will be presented using two different methods, flux based method, which involves physical quantity and coefficient of linear equation based approach, which is, uh, which involves the coefficient of linear algebraic equation. This will be presented as a two-step solution, solution methodology, and this will be presented as a single-step solution methodology. The flex-based methodology is presented here on a uniform Cartesian grid. Just to begin with a simpler situation, although this can also be used for a non-uniform Cartesian grid, whereas this coefficient of linear equation-based methodology is presented on a non-uniform grid, However, this can also be used for a uniform. In almost all the other books in CFD, they follow a solution, solution methodology, which can be called as coefficient of linear equation based methodology. But uh, the companion book corresponding to this lecture series uh, had introduced another methodology, which involves physical quantities. So when, while you're writing your computer programs, the, the each and every line of the program involves physical quantity and that I had called as flux space solution methodology. That is the novelty corresponding to the companion. So this is the mind map corresponding to this chapter five on heat conduction from the companion book, where the physical law based finite volume method and the finite difference method was presented in the previous lecture, which corresponds to step two of CFD development. And the step three of CFD development, solution methodology will be presented here using two different types of methodologies. So we begin with the flux based solution methodology on a uniform grid. This is presented here using an explicit method. Now, whenever we say solution methodology, I have presented in my earlier lecture on introduction to CFD development that in solution methodology, there are three steps. First is solution method, second is implementation detail, and third is solution algorithm. So the solution method that is used here uh, for this methodology is explicit method. And then 
uh, we go to implementation detail and finally solution algorithm. So this solution methodology is presented first for unsteady one dimension unsteady heat conduction and then for 2D un unsteady heat conduction. And for both the one dimension and two dimensional cases, we start with the solution method that is the explicit method, then move to implementation detail and finally solution algorithm followed by some example problems. Let us begin with the solution method that is explicit method for this methodology. While presenting the finite volume method towards the end of the lecture, I had presented two different forms of the linear algebraic equation that we derive from finite volume method. The first form called as flux form and the second form called as coefficient of linear algebraic equation form. The, the flux form is used here for flux based solution methodology where this slide corresponds to flux based explicit method on a Cartesian grid for 1D conduction. So if you take a one dimensional problem, it could be heat transfer across a thin sheet where the dimension of the sheet is very long along the other two directions. So let us suppose this is along the thickness of the sheet and I'm showing you a representative grid distribution along the thickness. Note that this is not the complete thickness. I have taken somewhere in between and showing you that because in a finite volume method, we, although there could be many grid points, many yellow circles, but we derive equi a numeric equation for one of the representative point and we express it in an indicial form. As I highlighted that in your undergraduate in heat transfer, you derive one equations. Here also, although we have many points, we derive for only one of the points and we write that equation in an indicial form and you basically use loop to use that equation for all the internal grid points of yellow circle. So I'm showing you just some intermediate internal values of grid point corresponding to P. This is at E and W. Note that this is a one dimensional problem. So the domain is one dimensional. The domain is along the X direction and the control volume which is shown here is a line. In a one dimensional case, the control volume is a line. In a 2D, it's a two dimensional, uh, in a Cartesian coordinate, a rectangular region. In 3D, it's a, a cuboid or a rectangular, it's a, it's a cuboid or a rectangular parallel point. So in a 1D conduction, note that the volume of the control volume, this is your control volume, where this is the east surface, this is the west surface, and the volume of the control volume for a 1D case corresponds to the width of the control volume, that is delta x, because your domain is on line, so its volume is corresponding to the length of this line. And the surface area, because the dimension of the control volume delta y and delta z, we take it to be unity. Similarly, if you talk about the east surface and west surface, the area, surface area that we take is unity because we take delta y and delta z is equal to unity. Now, in the previous lecture, I had mentioned that while doing the finite volume discretization, especially when you use the second approximation for Fourier law of heat conduction, you calculate dt by dx on the faces of the control volume because you basically calculate qx comma e here, qx comma w here where these green squares are, like, are acting like a pixels for Qx and the yellow circles are acting like pixels for temperature. You calculate conduction heat fluxes. Basically, uh, we have to apply Fourier law of heat conduction. And the second approximation that was presented in physical law based finite volume method involves dt by dx calculation from here as temperature at this point minus temperature at this point divided by the distance between these two points, which is delta xc. Similarly, when you calculate delta xw, this then in the denominator, you get this delta xw. Note that this delta xe and delta xw, they are equal to width of the control volume for a uniform grid. And this is flux space explicit method is presented here for a un uniform grid. Although I'm writing the expression in a general form, where for a uniform grid, because as I said that although this is pre uh, finally presented for uniform grid, but this can also be applied for a non-uniform grid. So uh, this is the uh, second approximation in physical law based finite volume method where you calculate the 
conduction fluxes. So in the first step of flux based explicit method, explicit method for the solution methodology, we in the first step we calculate the conduction fluxes. In a Bundy, there are only two fluxes, or there are two surfaces, east and west. And this is the expression which has been shown earlier in a flux form on the linear algebraic formulation. Now in the second step, basically we take this conduction fluxes and multiply by the respective surface area, which is unity in this case, and we calculate the total heat gained by conduction, the net rate of heat transfer entering into the control volume. So we will uh, uh, calculate total uh, heat gained by conduction as QXW minus QXE. Note that the surface area here is unity. Why? So this is an expression which I said it's applicable for all green squares all over the domain. Now, when you implement in the code, know that this, this wherever we have capital P in the implementation details, we convert this capital P into I, and wherever we have capital E, our argument is I plus one. So this formula, when we go for implementation detail, it becomes minus K P in a computer program, T at I plus one minus T at I. And when we calculate QXW, this becomes T at I minus T at I minus one. So this west is I minus one. Okay, so this location X plus delta X is denoted by the running indices I plus one and X minus delta X by I minus one. Now after calculating the conduction fluxes on green square, basically to uh, calculate the total heat gained by conduction, this is the total heat gained by polymetric heat generation over the time interval delta T. And once you add this to, you get total heat gain by conduction and volumetric heat generation over the time interval of delta T. If you multiply this total heat gain with delta T divided by rho Cp delta X, which was presented in the final physical law based finite volume method, you get for the same point for the new picture, what is the additional temperature increase or decrease. So using this formula, we calculate in the second step temperature. So in the first step, we calculate QX on green square. In the second step, we calculate the temperature at the yellow circles for the new picture. Note that the first picture correspond, uh, the data for the first picture, the temperature distribution for the first picture corresponds to the, is obtained from an initial condition and boundary conditions. After presenting the flux based explicit method as a two step method, now let us go to implementation details. This implementation details is like nut and bolts to develop a product. Our product is a CFD software and as software, the nuts and bolts corresponds to the data structures and the loops that will be presented in the implementation details. This is one of the novelty in the companion book, uh, which you will not find in the other books, that here the nuts and bolts corresponding to a product development, which corresponds to the loops and the running indices is presented in a separate section in the book as implementation. So let us uh, consider uh, this is the thickness of the plate and the simplest form of the grid generation is a uniform grid generation where we divide this along this is the uh, in a 1D problem this is domain is corresponding to the direction in which the this is along the thickness where the rate of heat transfer is occurring and uh, so we divide this domain into certain discrete grid points or pixelized representation let us suppose we divide into five equal parts so let's suppose these are the five equal parts and then we locate our uh, internal grid points or internal pixels at the centroid which is shown here in 1d the centroid is the center of the so basically this line is divided into five equal parts and each, each part, the center corresponding to each part is shown here as yellow pixels. And so we apply initial conditions. So let us suppose you are given that the thickness, the plate is, the this sheet is at an, uh, initially at an ambient temperature of 30 degree. So all this yellow circle will be at a temperature of 30 degree. Now let us suppose suddenly if left wall is zero degree centigrade and right wall is 100 degree centigrade. So you will apply zero here and 100 here. So this way you know the temperature distribution corresponding to the first picture. The first picture corresponds to temperature distribution with respect to 
x, which is where x is along the thickness of the plate. And in that, you uh, so this you know the data for the first picture. Now, using the data for the first picture, note that in an explicit method, let me show you again in the previous slide. In the explicit method, note that the total heat gained by conduction is obtained using the data from previous picture. Note that the superscript for all this temperature is N. N corresponds to the data corresponding to the previous picture and N plus one corresponds to the data from the new picture. So from the data of the first picture that is obtained from initial condition and boundary condition, note that in the first step we have calculated QX and then the total heat gained by conduction, note that you are calculating the total heat gained by conduction using the data from the first picture. And in case of heat generation, mostly it is not time-wise varying. So I have taken as time-wise invariant, so I'm not using any approximation for the heat generation. And it's just that the volumetric, generation, volumetric heat generation, this Q bar, is multiplied by the volume, the control volume, which is delta X. So in the first step, we calculate the conduction heat fluxes. So basically, there are the way we have done grid generation, there are seven points. One and seven are the boundary points shown by blue circle, and two to six are internal points. Where, uh, as I had discussed in my previous lecture, out of all these yellow circles, I call certain yellow circles whose one of the nearest neighbor, east or west neighbor, is a boundary point as the border point. So this two and six I call as border grid points, which are uh, differentiated for, for, from the interior grid points by thicker boundary of the yellow circle. So two and six are the border grid points and three to five are interior grid points and interior plus border grid points corresponds to internal grid points. So we know the data for the first picture which corresponds to the time level n and our objective is to obtain the temperature for time level n plus one which is separated by a time interval delta t. This delta t we determine in an explicit method using an stability factor. So we cannot choose any arbitrary value of delta t. We have an equation for explicit method that we take to calculate delta t star and that value we use it for our simulations. So in the first step, so this slide is presenting an animated representation of the formula that I presented for explicit method in the previous slide. So in the first step, we calculate qx at green square and so basically the data from the previous, the data for uh, two grid points are picked up to calculate QX at these green squares. Note that the loop for QX is one to six. There are six green squares. And to calculate, so this is like uh, QX comma three. So basically we use a loop where I is varying from one to six to calculate QX. This is QX3. You note that QX3 is calculated as T4 minus T3 divided by the width of the control volume, which is delta X. Note that in a uniform grid, the distance between the yellow circle is same as the width of the control volume. So in the first step, we calculate QX. And in the second step, we basically take the this conduction fluxes at two points and we calculate total heat gained by conduction and volumetric heat generation and finally temperature. So these two QX are taken to calculate temperature here, this Q two QX are taken to calculate temperature here and so on. So we use a loop where the second step, the formula that I had shown, we use that formula for temperate, for temperature varying from two to six. And this way we calculate the yellow circle value. Note that with respect to time, the boundary values are not changing. Let us suppose left is zero, right is 100. So this values, this blue circle values with respect to time are time-wise invariant, whereas this yellow circle values change. So we are only bothered to calculate at various time intervals, the value of temperature at this internal grid. points. So uh, in the uh, companion book, uh, this computational stencil, because in a book I cannot put an animation in the hard copy. So this animation which I presented is presented 
in the book as a figure 5.8 where instead of animated representation i have used solid line dashed line and filled symbols to represent the computational stencil where here in the implementation detail i am also showing you the loop which is used note that the imax is uh, seven in the previous slide but uh, you can write a program by looking into some po small point distribution but note that uh, you write a program which is general in nature so that a user who is using your code or a software he can this field field would decide how many grid points he wants to take so basically instead of we use the maximum number of grid points in the x direction as imax uh, for one d problem and in two d problem we also have jmax so basically uh, the loop for qx is 1 to imax minus 1 so in the previous slide it was 7 7 minus 1 it is 1 to 6 Whereas for the yellow circle, it is two to seven minus one, so it is two to six. That are five yellow circles. We so we calculate at this five yellow circles, and here you can see we calculate at this six green squares. So this is like a what is called as computational stencils. So after presenting the nuts and bolts for the code development corresponding to the implementation details, let us go to the solution algorithm, which presents the step by step procedure, which you implement in the Computer program to develop your code. The first step is that a user has to enter certain inputs, like material property in conduction. The material property are thermal conductivity, density, and specificity of the solid. Then he has to in a one D problem in the Cartesian coordinate system. He has to basically Enter the thickness of the sheet that we are considering for conduction. This let us say the thickness is L one. Then in a one D, he has to enter the number of grid size. Then he has to enter the parameters corresponding to initial condition and boundary conditions. You can have various types of boundary conditions. Like in convective boundary condition, a user has to enter convective heat transfer coefficient and ambient temperature. For constant heat flux, he should enter the constant, the value of the constant heat flux, and so on. So these are he has to enter the initial condition and boundary conditions. Every problem has certain governing parameter like volumetric heat generation is a governing parameter in conduction. So he, uh, depending on a problem, one has to enter the governing parameter. And finally, uh, uh, in an explicit method, there is only one loop, and there is only and which and the stopping criteria corresponds to the steady state convergence. So in a steady state field, in a conduction problem, which is just the steady state, we want to uh, create pictures at different time instants until the picture stops changing, or until if you make a movie and in the movie the picture has stops changing, then you want to stop it. So use a you want to use a steady state convergence criteria, and the criteria I had presented in my previous lecture. And in that criteria, you have to basically check that the steady state convergence parameter should approach towards zero. Computer doesn't understand zero, so we have to define what is called as convergence tolerance. So this epsilon st is the steady state convergence tolerance which a user is trying. Note that this thermophysical property, the material property, the geometrical parameter that you calculate while grid generation, this appears as a coefficient of linear elliptic equations. Like uh, the in the coefficient uh, a e a w that I had shown you in the previous lecture using finite polynomial method, it basically consists of these two things: thermophysical property and the geometrical parameters corresponding to the grid conditions. And these boundary conditions appear when we discretize the boundary grid points. The governing parameter appears in the various terms that we can. so after uh, so a, a user only knows what are the parameters corresponding to the problem which he is solving so after he enters that input then you have to write your program to calculate the geometrical parameters in a uniform grid you only need to calculate one geometrical parameters that's the width of the control volume um, uh, because in uh, in uniform grid the delta x is comes out to be equal to delta x w However, near to the boundary, let me go back and uh, discuss that. The uniform grid, although you need only delta x, but I would like to point out that in the first step, when you calculate q x, you calculate 
qx here, these two values will be used. So to calculate qx here, whenever, so to calculate temperature of this minus, if you use a forward here, if you use forward difference, then the temperature here minus this, on the distance between these two yellow circle is delta x by two. What I'm highlighting is in a uniform grid, the width of the control volume and the distance between yellow circle is same, which I had presented in my previous slides also. Width of the control volume is between this red, red dash line which is shown. This distance and the distance between any two yellow consecutive yellow circle is delta x. Let's suppose that the thickness, if the this thickness of the sheet is one centimeter, then delta x in this case is 0 0.2. So this distance is 0 0.2, this is 0 0.2. And if you take the distance between any two red this dash line, it is 0 0.2. However, the distance between a blue circle and the border yellow circle, it is delta x by 2. Now when you calculate qx for the first point, note that this uses delta x by 2. So in when you calculate geometrical parameters in the solution algorithm, for a uniform grid, you can calculate only delta x, which is equal to the length of the thickness of the sheet, which is L1 divided by I max minus two, seven minus two, which is a five division that what you are doing. Okay, so there are only two values which are involved, delta x and delta x by two, when you calculate the qx values. So this way you are only bothered to calculate one geometrical parameter in your form grid, that is delta x, which is given by this expression. And in an explicit method, <coughs> you can use the step three criteria that was presented in previous lecture to calculate the limiting time step for explicit method and that you can use in your computer program. <laughs> for the temperature, um, now this is the step corresponding to the giving the data for the first picture. So basically you apply the initial condition and apply boundary condition for those boundary points which are subjected to Dirichlet boundary. So note that I am presenting the application of boundary condition separately for Dirichlet boundary condition and non Dirichlet boundary condition. I'll discuss the reason for this little later. So in the third step, we apply the, uh, the boundary condition for blue grid points, which are subjected to constant wall temperature of boundary conditions. For other walls where you have other boundary condition like insulated, constant heat flux or convective, which basically involves the gradient. Now in those cases, when you discretize the blue grid point is a function of the border yellow circle value, which is the part of the interior. And it changes with respect to time. So we have to keep that boundary condition within, within inside the time loop. So that is presented here as separate step, fourth step where you apply boundary condition for those blue grid points which are subjected to non Dirichlet or non constant wall temperature type of boundary condition. Then you set the, the data that you have got from the, which you have, when you are applying the boundary conditions, you apply for P, but before you go for the computation for the new time step, because there you will be using this symbol, you basically take all the data for the initial condition as well as boundary condition, that is the data for the first picture, you take that data and store it in a separate matrix because now this matrix will be used to generate the data for the new picture. So we use a two-step flux-based methodology where in the first step we calculate the conduction fluxes at, that is qx at all the green square, at all the face center. The equation was presented in equation 5.17. This equation number corresponds to the companion textbook. Then once you calculate conduction fluxes, in the second step, you calculate total heat gain by conduction plus volumetric heat generation over the time interval delta T. And finally, you calculate the temperature for the next time step. So, and once you do this two-step methodology for all the yellow circles, you have obtained the temperature for the next time step then you basically check for steady state convergence or the stopping criteria. 
So you calculate the stopping parameter, which we call as unsteadiness. In my previous lecture, I mentioned that uh, it is suggested that you should calculate the uh, time-wise variation of temperature at various grid points or yellow circles. And that too, you should be presented in a non-dimensional form so that your convergence tolerance is independent of the uh, independent of the material that you are considering. So this is a non-dimensional uh, time-wise gradient of non-dimensional temperature theta. I have discussed in my previous lecture in detail about this. And uh, so basically, this uh, time-wise temporal variation of non-dimensional temperature should be less than or equal to your convergence tolerance, which we define somewhere close to zero. You may define it like 10 to the power minus 4, which is considered as practically zero by the computer. If this unsteady parameter is greater than epsilon, means it has not reached to zero. So when unsteadiness is non-zero, you want to go back to step four and you keep generating the data for the next picture. And note that this step four corresponds to the non dirichlet boundary conditions where the blue grid point value is a function of the neighboring yellow grid point, which is a part of the interior and which is changing with respect to time. So note that in non dirichlet boundary conditions, the blue circle value varies with time. I will later on show you through this through an example problem using an animation. So you continue till you reach to the study scale. Now in this slide, I will show you certain example problem. Let us consider a thin sheet. This is the length of the sheet, which is L. Left wall is maintained at a constant temperature, which is zero degree centigrade. Right wall is maintained at 100 degree centigrade, as shown in the here. The initial condition of this sheet is 30 degree centigrade. So you can give 30 degree centigrade all the yellow circle, left blue circle zero, right blue circle 100. So this is the data for the first picture. Here we have taken heat generation as zero. And for a grid point of well and steady state convergence criteria of 0.4, I will show you an animation. So this is the first picture. This is corresponding to uh, uh, well grid points. So you have grid points at 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and so on. So at zero, uh, you have a blue circle here. You have a zero degree and another blue circle at this boundary. So this is zero, this is 100. All the intermediate yellow circles, they are at 30. So this is the first picture. So this picture, this is the uh, this is the picture corresponding to the initial condition in boundary condition. It is just that the software plots the discrete data by a continuous line. So that's why it is joining zero and thirty degree between the blue circle and the border yellow circle. <clears throat> now, so once you develop the computer program using the solution method and implementation detail as well as solution algorithm presented earlier. Then uh, if you run that program corresponding to this case, this is for a material of pure iron, we use the thermophysical property of pure iron. Then this is the movie that you can create where the temperature finally it's approaching towards the linear variation that you studied in your undergraduate course and the steady state uh, temperature variation is presented. So, so this way you basically apply and confirm to your analytical solution that your computer program this is completing the testing. Okay, so note that here for 1D conduction, I have started. The, we are following all the steps of CFD development, where the grid generation was presented for us by uh, where we are dividing a line into certain equispace points, and then um, the first step grid generation, second step uh, algebraic formulation where finite volume is used for internal grid points, finite difference for blue grid, uh, the boundary grid point, and in the third step, solution methodology was presented. And finally, I am showing you the testing with the help of certain example problems. The real problem was, was with no heat generation. Now, here we are taking a heat generation of 30 megawatt per meter cube. And the other parameters are the same, left wall 0, right wall 100, initial condition of 30 degrees centigrade. Now, in this case, uh, we will observe that in your movie, instead of reaching a linear variation, since you have a heat generation, heat generation leads to, can lead to a local maxima in the temperature. And that way you see now the temperature, although your limiting values are 0 and 100, but due to heat generation, this is the steady state temperature distribution. 
So you can see your maximum temperature is greater than the maximum boundary temperature of 100 degrees centigrade. The heat generation leads to a local, can lead to a local maximum. This is an example problem in the textbook in the chapter five, example five point one, where uh, the book presents the computer program also corresponding to this problem using the implementation details in much more detail. Uh, presented in the book. So they're using the flex space methodology for 1D and steady state heat conduction using explicit method. Uh, in this example problem, the objective is to uh, uh, present CFD development application as well as analysis. But here in this slide, I'm presenting CFD application and code verification, where we'll compare our results with numerical results also. So I'll show you a figure where we have compared the numerical result with the, with the analytical solution. So that's code verification. So this is a problem, earlier problem was for pure iron, this is for stainless steel sheet and the length of the uh, sh thickness of the sheet is one centimeter. The, we, I'll present the result for two cases, heat generation of no heat generation and heat generation of 100 megawatt per meter cube. Left wall is zero, right wall is 100 and initial condition is 30 degrees. So in the book, uh, this figure is presented, figure 5.9, which uh, for heat generation, no heat generation, this shows, note that uh, uh, the, the steady, the, the dashed line which is shown here corresponds to unsteady state solution. So like this is corresponding to time P is equals to zero, where all these points are at um, 30 degrees centigrade. This is corresponding to 10 times of time interval we obtained. This corresponds to 20 times of time interval, 30, 40, and so on. And finally, the solid line that is being shown corresponds to the steady state solution. Now, this figure compares the steady state analytical solution, which is shown by a continuous line, and the steady state numerical solution, which is which are the discrete data that we have obtained for the 12 point that we have considered two boundary point and 10 internal points. So there are 12 square symbols which are shown here. So this is the steady state temperature distribution that you can obtain from your code and similarly compare the steady state analytical and numerical and check the accuracy of your results that you've obtained from your computer program. This is called as testing or code verification because you are comparing your numerical results with some analytical solution. The, the, for those problems where the unsteady solution reaches to the steady state, uh, this initial unsteady solution is called as transient solution. So this is the, the dashed line corresponds to the transient numerical solution. Now, when you consider a con heat generation, as I mentioned, this is the, now this dashed line for this case this is a heat generation. This was not no heat generation. So the heat generation uh, with respect to time, this dashed line is showing how the temperature is evolving. This is at zero. 10 delta T, 20 delta T, and so on. And finally, this uh, line is representing the steady state temperature distribution for this heat generation. Uh, here again, the solid line corresponds to analytical solution, and the symbols correspond to numerical solution on 12 grid points. And you can see an excellent agreement between the numerical solutions for, with, for without heat generation and with heat generation. So this is demonstrate the testing or code verification for 1D and steady state heat conduction. After completing the 1D conduction, let us go to the 2D conduction for the flux space solution methodology. And the simplest form of the grid generation uniform grid, we draw equal space vertical lines. Basically we are dividing, we are given a plate of certain dimensions. This is the, if we are dividing into five point, five uh, equal space vertical lines, and horizontal lines, then basically you are converting into uh, 25 small regions, which we call as control volume, and we locate the grid points at the centroid of this control volume. So you can note that the distance between any two consecutive yellow circle is same in this problem. These are the boundary grid points. These are the grid points for temperature, yellow for points inside, and blue for points at the boundaries. And these are the running indices for the data structure matrix. Now, these are the like pixels for temperature. These circles are for temperature. But as I mentioned that we have pixels or grid points for Qx as well as Qy. Qx we represented by green square. 
and note that if you talk of a uh, QX, it's the uh, it's is the it is on the east face of this control volume, but it is also on the west face of I plus one control volume. So we calculate this QX only once. We do not want to calculate separately for this control volume and then again for the next control volume. So in the implementation details, we follow certain procedure to avoid uh, double calculations uh, for the two adjacent control volumes. And uh, here I'm showing you the grid point corresponding to the green square. So note that there were five by five yellow circles, but the green squares, if you see, they are six in the X direction and five in the Y direction. So later on the loop that we use for to calculate QX, it's varying from one to I max minus one. In the J, it varies from two to J max minus one, because this green square are six in the X direction, five in the Y direction. This is like the pixel or grid points for QR. Now here you can see now the green, the red inverted triangle, which is like pixels for QR. They are five in the X direction and six in the Y direction. So later on, <coughs> while implementing, we use a loop of I is equals to two to I max minus one and J is equals to one to J max minus one. This is a computational sensor for the representative form. So after presenting the grid generation where I demonstrated the various grid points for temperature, uh, QX and QY. Now in a, in a flex-based solution, solution methodology, we use the flux form of the algebraic formulation, where in the first step we calculate QX. Now in a 2D, you not only have Q, uh, QX, but you also have QY. So this is the discrete representation by second approximation and limit representation of real of heat conduction. So using that, in the first step, we calculate <coughs> QX at green square and QY at red inverted triangles. And then basically, uh, we multiply QX by the surface area. Now, the QX, the surface area is a vertical line, which is uh, delta Y on a uniform grid. Same for all the, while calculating all the QX. And uh, for QY, uh, it's a, the surface area is delta x. So we multiply, we to calculate total heat gained by conduction. We calculate the rate at which heat transfer is entering into the control volume. So west minus east, south minus north, and we multiply by the surface area. For qx, we multiply by delta y. For qy, we multiply by delta x, the respective surface areas, and calculate total heat gained by conduction using the data from previous picture. Note that all this temperature has from previous picture. So using the total heat gain by conduction and volumetric heat generation, uh, we use this equation in the second step to calculate the temperature of the same grid point at the new picture. And we use, you know that we use a loop there to scroll through all the yellow circle, two to I max minus one, two to J max minus one. We use this formula. Note that here the formula is a single formula, but we use it for with a loop in an initial form. Where wherever you have I E capital E, we write I plus one, P e, we write e. here in a 2D, we also have J. So this is I plus one comma J, this is I comma J, this is I comma J. W wherever we we write I minus one. Wherever we have not, we write I comma J plus one and south I comma J minus one. So in the solution methodology, I'm presenting this as sub subscripts as uh, in letters. Okay, not capital E, capital W. But when we implement in a computer program, we replace this by the respective running indices, which corresponds to the address of the respective neighbors in the matrix with certain row number and column number. So after presenting the explicit method for 2D conduction as a two-step process, the implementation detail involves uh, you know the data of the first picture uh, from the initial condition and boundary conditions. These are given to you. So in the step one, on all green square, you use this loop to calculate QX. So, and you use this loop to calculate QY. And using this QX, QY, in the second step, for all the yellow circles, you use this loop to calculate total heat gained by conduction and volumetric heat generation and finally temperature at all yellow circles, which are inside the group. After presenting the implementation detail, finally, uh, the solution algorithm is very similar to what I had presented in conduction, in one dimensional conduction. 
So I'm not presenting the solution algorithm because there will be too much of repetition. It's just that uh, instead of one direction, we have to do things in two direction. And your data structure instead of 1D matrix, here it's a 2D matrix. Example problem that is presented here is, uh, let us suppose left wall is 100, bottom wall is 200, right wall 300, top wall 400 degrees centigrade. And so you know the data for the first picture as shown here, all the yellow circle 100, the uh, other initial condition is 100 degrees centigrade. And the res respective boundaries are 100, 200, 300 and 400 degrees centigrade. Let's suppose this is a stainless steel plate where the, it's a square plate of dimension one meter. There is no heat generation. We're taking a grid size of 12 by 12 and a steady state convergence tolerance of 10 to the power minus 4. So here I will show you an animation corresponding to this problem where uh, what is shown here, the lines are shown and some color is shown. In the line, there is some number which is written, which, which, is, which are we call as isotherms. So these are the values of temperature, 150, 200, 300, and 350, so on. Okay. And there is a color where the blue color corresponds to 100 degree, green corresponds to 200, red corresponds to 300, and white corresponds to 400. And gradually there is a color bar. So when you develop a computer program, you basically generate a discrete data. But when you use a graphical software, it uh, does some local interpolations and basically fill it with is a complete color as if the data is continuous. So you can see that there are two things. One is line, second is color. Line are called as, these are called as line contours and the mm, colors are called as, basically they are contour plot. There are two types of contour, line contour and color contour. So the, these lines are corresponding to isotherms and the colors are corresponding to what we call as color contours, which are shown flooded. So note that our boundary condition is left wall is zero. Once we know the temperature distribution, I see that this movie is like a scientifically exciting movie. Because by looking into this movie, you can get an idea of what is the like what is the direction of rate of heat transfer. Just to explain this, uh, let me uh, do I'll do one thing. Uh, this is the steady state temperature distribution. So let it so left wall is hundred. Now, what is the temperature near to the wall? This is a problem with no heat generation. So note that the temperature variation will be monotonic. There will be no local maxima or minima. So if this is 100, this line is at 150. This line is at 150. Then this is at 140, 130, 120, 110 and so on. So near to this vertical wall, the temperature is greater than 100. So the rate of heat transfer will be outward. Now, the bottom wall, you have a temperature of 200. Now, when you see the left part of the bottom wall, note that on this line, the temperature is 200. On this line, the temperature is 150. So on the left half, the temperature is varying from 150 to 200. Whereas the bottom wall is at 200. So above this left portion of the bottom wall, the temperature is less than 200. So, so nearby the temperature is less than 200. So you expect that the rate of heat transfer should be outward, sorry, inward. You have, here you have 200 and nearby you have temperature less than 200. Whereas on the right half, here you have a temperature of 200 and above it you have, a, this is 210, 220, 230, 240 and 253. Inside the temperature is more. Okay, so the rate of heat transfer will be from larger temperature to a smaller temperature. So here you will have an outward rate of uh, the direction of heat transfer. Now, if you look into the right wall, it is 300. Here again, you can see that near to the bottom half, you have less temperature near to the bottom half of the right wall. There is a change in the direction of rate of heat transfer in the bottom wall as well as on the right wall. In the top wall, this is 350, 360, 370, 380, and so on. So nearby the temperature is less, the rate of heat transfer will be inward. So by in the research, we uh, I would mention by looking into this uh, temperature distribution, once you do a simulation, you can look into this scientifically exciting movie and you can get an idea of the direction of rate of heat transfer. You can plot the heat fluxes and get the idea of the direction of heat transfer, but this figure will make you understand why 
there is a change in the direction of rate of heat transfer by presenting the change in the um, temperature contours along near to the bottom wall towards the various walls note that in uh, research we do not know what result will come but we should be clever enough to judge what result should not come so whenever you do uh, develop a computer program once you plot such data you should look carefully that whether the result is looking like in this case if we have a local maxima somewhere in between this is not expected in a uh, steady state heat conduction with volumetric heat generation so you may be doing some mistake in your computer program so you should go back and check so you should present your result by making your own independent judgment after you have plotted the result so you should develop your wisdom to not present results uh, which are which, which is which are unphysical which are like colorful fluid dynamics but not the real world fluid dynamics so in the book uh, corresponding there is an example problem and there is a figure 5.12 where for uh, heat generation of zero and 50 kilowatt per meter cube this is the steady state temperature distribution corresponding to the figure 5.12 in the companion so with this i had come to the first solution methodology flux based solution methodology now i'm going to the second solution methodology coefficient of linear equation based methodology now this solution will again will be presented in three different steps solution method implementation detail and solution algorithm and it will also presented first for one dimensional heat conduction and then for two dimensional heat conduction the flux based methodology was presented only for explicit method this will be presented for both explicit and implicit method and uh, the flux based methodology was presented on a uniform grid here this will be presented on a non uniform cartesian grid the first i will start with how do we generate a non uniform cartesian grid uniform cartesian grid is generated by equis spaced vertical and horizontal line now here i am discussing the procedure to generate non uniformly spaced vertical and horizontal lines so uh, so there is a standard procedure that i am presenting here but this procedure is used later on to generate curvilinear grid curvilinear grid points for complex geometric problems so there is a part 3 of this course where uh, for complex geometry the grid that is presented is a curvilinear grid it is just that there are two family of lines in a, a cartesian grid the family corresponds to the vertical and horizontal lines in a curvilinear grid there are two family of curves that we consider so in a curvilinear as well as in non uniform grid the procedure the basic procedure that is used is presented here the basic procedure involves a transformations so the idea is that i start with a uniformly spaced vertical and horizontal line and basically use certain equation to transform the corners of the or the the points which are intersecting the horizontal and vertical line corresponding to those points there will I'll, i'll present a formula which we use which is corresponding to x as a function of uh, the grid the coordinate in a in this domain so basically we define we do a transformation so in our physical space we want to generate a non uniform grid or a curvilinear grid so we start with a, a space which is a square domain and of size 1 by 1 and we call this domain as a computational space and you know that for a non uniform grid generation the coordinates in this domain is not x and y x and y is the domain in which we want to solve our problem on using a non uniform or a curvilinear grid but to generate a non uniform non uniform spaced vertical and horizontal lines we start with a domain which involves uniform grid generation so you can see that the grid generation in this domain which we call as computational domain where the coordinate is xi and zeta xi is along the horizontal direction zeta is along the vertical direction so note that so what are the coord so here i am showing you certain equis space vertical line this is xi is equals to 0 this is xi equals to 0.2 0.4 0.6 0.8 and 1 note that that 
the height of this computational domain is given by the coordinate xi which is 1 and the length is given by 1 so zeta is equal to 0 here 0 0.2 zeta 0 0.4 0 0.6 0 0.8 and 1 so with this you can obtain the how many corners you have in this case there are 36 corner because you have 6 point here 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 and 1, 6 point here and 6 point here. So you total have 36 corners corresponding to those 36 corners. Once you do this division, you can obtain the xi and zeta coordinate of all those 36 corners of this control volumes. Now we have an equation. First, I will, uh, we have an equation we, which we present xi as a function of x, y, zeta as a function of x, y. Then we do an inverse transformation and we have finally obtained x as a function of xi, zeta. So once we know the 36 corner value coordinates, we substitute those 36 xi and zeta and calculate, I will show you the specific functional relationship uh, for various types of non-uniform groups in later slide. But we have a formula by basically we where this xi and zeta are the known values and we calculate using this formula x and y. So I will show you that you know zeta 0 and xi varying, zeta 0.2 and xi varying. Corresponding to the xi and zeta, there is a, when you use this formula, you are getting a certain x and y which I am presenting here. So note that there are 36 circles in this domain which are uniformly spaced. And using formula separately for x and y as a function of xi zeta, when we use this formula, we get 36 x and y, which involves lines which are non-uniformly spaced. These are non-uniformly spaced vertical lines. These are non-uniformly spaced horizontal lines. Okay, so note that to generate a non-uniform grid, we have we do we do a we use an equation which is a transformation equation where to calculate x and y coordinate we have a equation which involves transformation and from the known xi zeta values which has been obtained in a square domain note that we always take the computational domain as square and that two dimension one by one and so you can have any size of shape and uh, size of the domain in for non-uniform grid distribution but for all size and for any type of non-uniformity in the grid distribution this is same we take a domain of one by one and depending on the number of divisions if we want we decide how many vertical and horizontal line we take here and basically through this transformation we obtain the grid points which corresponds to the corners of the control volume. Then once you know the corners of the control, uh, corners of the control volume, you can take the means of the corner for each control volume and obtain the coordinate for the centroid. So these are like the coordinate of the, so note that in non-uniform grid generation, I will use two symbols. When I use X and Y, they are corresponding to the corners. And for the centroid, I'll use a symbol XC and YC. Okay, so from the corner coordinates, you can obtain the centroid coordinate. These are for the internal grid points. And similarly, you can obtain for the blue grid points, which are corresponding to the boundary. This way, once you, and another thing to note here is, now here the width of the control volume is varying. In a uniform grid generation, there is only one geometrical parameter, delta x and delta y, which we are constant. Now, when you move from a uniform grid to a non-uniform grid, note that, now the delta x, which is the width of the control volume in the x direction. You can see that the width of the control volume, if you compare the width as compared to the next control volume, the width of the control volume is gradually increasing. The delta x value of the control volume, which is between any two green vertical lines, it is gradually increasing. Similarly, if you see delta x, which is the width of the control volume, uh, between any two horizontal lines, it is gradually increasing. Note that the horizontal width of the control volume in a non-uniform grid generation varies only in the x direction. It is not varying along the y direction. 
the delta x is varying only in the x direction. Why it is not varying in the y direction? Because the spacing between any two vertical line, even if you are doing a non-uniform grid generation, to take any two consecutive vertical line, the spacing between any two vertical line, the horizontal spacing, is same. Similarly, if you take any two horizontal line, the vertical spacing between any two horizontal line is same. So what I'm emphasizing is, in a uniform grid, the width of the control volume, delta x, delta y, is a single value. In a non-uniform grid, it's a matrix, but it is a one-dimension matrix. Where delta x is varying in x direction, so we write delta x i. Delta y varies in the y direction, so we write it delta y j. Later on, when we go to the curvilinear grid, this geometrical parameter are here they are one dimensional matrix. For complex geometries, this coordinate will be two dimensional matrix. So, as you move from uniform grid to non uniform grid to curvilinear grid for complex geometry, the complexity of the data structure which is involved to calculate the geometrical parameter increases from single value in uniform grid. To a one dimensional matrix in a non uniform Cartesian grid here, and later on for curvilinear grid, it becomes a two dimensional matrix. So, this one dimension matrix that I mentioned, it is not applicable, only applicable for the width of the control volume. Now, your distance between yellow circles, delta xc, delta xw, delta y, and delta ys, this distances also are one dimensional matrices. More about it is presented in the implementation. So this slide presents a solution algorithm to generate a non-uniform Cartesian grid. So we start with the number of, let us suppose in this case, i max, j max grid points that you want. And in this case, when you talk of grid generation, basically this i max, j max uh, is corresponding to the number of circles that you have. Okay. So this uh, delta xi, which will basically give you, uh, through which you basically obtain the xi and zeta coordinates of the corner, using the imx, dmx corresponding to the maximum circles that you finally want to generate in your non-uniform grid generation. The delta xi is given by one divided by imx minus one, and the delta zeta is given by one divided by jmx minus one. So first you calculate delta xi, delta zeta, and in a, in a computational domain, xi zeta domain, where you have a domain size of one by one, you calculate the coordinates of the vertices. As I had said, there are 36 vertices in the previous slide in the computational domain. So you calculate 36 xi and zeta using this delta xi and delta zeta. Using those 36 xi and zeta, you can compute the coordinate of the vertices using the inverse transformation equations, where you have separate equation for x and y. Once you have calculated the coordinate of the corners of the non-uniform control volume, then you can calculate the coordinate of the centroid denoted by xc and yc by taking the mean of the coordinates of the corners for each control volume. So it's a straightforward procedure to generate a non-uniform grid. Here I'm presenting the expression which will lead you to a non-uniform grid generation. There are various types of non-uniform grid generation. I am presenting here one of the type of non-uniform grid generation where you have a equal clustering at y is equals to zero and h. Let us suppose you consider you are considering flow between two parallel plates where there is a bottom wall, there is a bottom flat plate, there is a top flat plate, and the fluid is flowing in between the two flat plates. And let us assume that this flat plate is very large perpendicular to the plane. So in this case, you know the, we know that if you consider this is called as flow in a plane channel, the velocity gradients are maximum near to the solid wall. So near to y is equals to zero and y is equals to h, which is the height of the channel, the velocity gradients are large. So we, when we generate non-uniform grid, we want the delta y to be smaller near to the wall and gradually it should increase near to the center. 
So for such type of grid generation, this is the equation which is present, which is, which is found in the literature for transformation. And from the same equation, you can write here x as a function of xi, and this you can write y as a function of zeta. So this is an inverse transformation. So basically, we use this equation: x as a function of xi, y as a function of zeta. And then I will show you that for a plane channel of height h. In the previous slide, if there is a term beta I would highlight other than xi and zeta. There is a term beta which is like a tuning parameter. I will just demonstrate in beta if you take 1.2, you get a this type of non-uniform regression. However, if you take the same number of note that in this non-uniform regression, the non-uniformity is only for horizontal line. In this slide, you can see the vertical lines are uniformly spaced. But the horizontal lines are non-uniformly spaced. Near to the wall, the spacing between two horizontal lines is minimum. And gradually towards the center, it is increasing. Similarly, near to the upper wall, the distance between the horizontal line is minimum and gradually it is increasing towards the center. So you have equal clustering at or fine grid at y is equal to zero, which is the bottom wall of the channel, and y is equal to x, which is the top wall of the channel. So if we use Beta is equal to 1.2. This is the non-uniform, spaced horizontal line that leads to non-uniform grid generation. If you, depending on the uh, Reynolds number or the velocity, which is velocity of the fluid that is going through the back channel, you may want to vary this. You may let us say you want same number of horizontal grid point, but much finer grid size near to the wall. So let's suppose if I take same number of horizontal line and I vary, or I take basically the same number of grid points, and if I vary beta from one to one point zero five, now you can see that near to the solid walls, the delta y is much smaller, and near to the center, the delta y is larger than as compared to beta is equal to one point. So if you use this formula, as you go closer to beta is equal to one. You get much finer delta y near to the wall at the expense of coarser grid near to the center. I have just presented one equation for non-uniform grid generation. There are separate books on non uh, on for grid generation. Uh, I have there are other topics to the as per the scope of the course. I have limited the non-uniform grid generation to one equation. But you can look into the literature to obtain there are various type of non-uniform grid generation, the equations for various type of non-uniform grid generation. After the non-uniform grid generation, note that the distance between the yellow circle in this case is between this two yellow circle, and if you compare between these two yellow circle, it is increasing. So this is corresponding to a computational stencil corresponding to the non-uniform grid generation. In a non-uniform grid generation, this delta x e is not equal to delta x, as in the case of uniform grid generation. Note that the distance between these two yellow circles and the yellow circles on the left side is different in the non-uniform, which was same in a uniform. Now here, when you use uh, the coefficient of linear algebraic equation based form of algebraic formulation presented in physical law based finite volume method earlier, for an explicit method, you end up with in this, this is a single step process. The flux based methodology is a two step process. The coefficient of linear equation based methodology is a single step process. And for 1D conduction, basically note that you get an expression which is a single equation. In flux based, we had two equations first for heat flux, second for calculating the temperature. Here we use a single equation where uh, basically when you write a computer program, in the flux based methodology, when you are writing the computer program, you are using variable to calculate conduction reflexes, total heat gain by conduction. So each and every line of the computer program involves physical quantity like conduction flux and you know, heat gain by conduction and volumetric heat generation. Whereas in the coefficient of linear equation based methodology, each line of your computer program will involve this mathematical symbols, which, is, which are the coefficient A E, A W, A P naught, B, and A. Where they are basically a function of two things: thermophysical property like k, rho, cp, and the geometrical parameter like this delta x e, delta x w, delta x p, and the time interval. So, this is a single step process. Where in an explicit method, 
you can note the right hand side all the temperature are from the previous picture because they have a superscript of n and on the left you have only one unknown so if, let us suppose there are five yellow circles you get a five linear algebraic equation where each equation you have one unknown and you can solve each equations independently there is if you consider an implicit method in an implicit method now you see that in each equation there are not more than three unknowns because the this is a computational sensor we have to calculate the temperature at point p it involves two neighbors so note that the our equation does not involve the temperature of all yellow circle it involves the temperature of neighboring yellow circle the immediate neighbor that two in one d there are two east west in two d it also involves north and south so the coefficient matrix uh, for one d it's basically a tridiagonal matrix and in a Two D, it's a pentadiagonal matrix, and all the other elements are zero. So it's a sparse matrix. So this is a uh, coefficient form of coefficient of linear algebraic form for uh, implicit method. Now, as far as the implementation details are concerned, uh, what we do in explicit method, if you are In a note that in a flux based methodology, it was two steps. So I have shown you animation in two steps. First for Q X in one D, and then to calculate total heat gain by conduction and finally the temperature. Here it's a single step process. So basically, what we do is that we calculate. So this is the data for the first picture. Let us suppose all yellow circles are thirty. Left blue circle is zero. This is hundred. So you know the data for the first picture. So basically, the temperature uh, so to calculate the temperature of let us say this yellow circle. Involves this yellow circle value, this yellow circle, and this blue. So this is like if this is Tp for the new picture, it involves Tp of the previous picture, Te of the previous picture, Tw of the previous picture. So these three values are involved, and they are multiplied with their respective coefficient as shown in the previous slide for an explicit method. And this is the computation. So three values are picked up, multiplied by their respective coefficient, okay, and to calculate the temperature for the new picture. Okay, so in this we obtain the temperature for the new picture in a single step, as shown by this computational stencil, which was presented as an animation. However, this is presented in the textbook as a static figure, five in the figure number is five point one three. So this is your computational stencil for explicit method. Where is an implicit method? Now you will see that to calculate temperature at this point P, it in, it will involve east and west neighbor of the same time instants. So it will involve these three values will be involved, and it will basically take only one value from the previous picture. So the computational stencil is like this. There are five yellow circles, so that's why I show you animation for five stencils. Okay, now if you compare the explicit method versus implicit method, as I was saying, if there are five yellow circle in each. The way computational stencil is basically a representation, a figurative representation of the explicit method that was the formula was presented in the previous slide. And in the figurative representation, you can see to calculate the value for these five yellow circles, for whenever uh, the equation is applied, it involves only one unknown. So each of this, your five equations and each equation, there is only one unknown, and you can obtain independently for all these five yellow circles. Whereas in this case, you get a So to calculate the temperature of this yellow circle, it involves the east and west neighbor of the same new picture, which you don't know. So you solve a coupled system of linear algebraic equations. So if there are five yellow circles, you get five algebraic equations, but there are not more than three unknowns. Why I'm saying is not more than three unknowns because uh, the reason is if you consider <coughs> the computational stencil for the border grid points. Now to calculate the uh, border grid points, let us suppose you are here. This involves temperature uh, of this point and this point. Now, if you are using a Dirichlet boundary conditions, where I suppose this is hundred. Now this is known. So for the border grid points, if the boundary condition is Dirichlet, then know that the algebraic equation for the border grid points involves two unknowns. So what I'm saying is, in 1D, 
for the interior grid points in each equation there are three unknowns but for the border grid points since one of the neighbor is boundary and the, you know the boundary value that come goes to the constant matrix instead of the coefficient matrix so in an implicit method you end up with a linear linear equation where in one d there are not more than three unknowns and in two d there are not more than five unknowns for the border grid points the number of unknowns reduces because the boundary condition if it's a dirichlet it will not appear in as a part of the unknown vector it will go on the right hand side as a constant after presenting the implementation detail the solution algorithm is quite similar to that presented for flux based methodology the, so i'll show the same steps which i had presented earlier for one d unsteady state conduction using flux based methodology here however i i'll highlight the difference for the coefficient of linear equation based methodology the first step is very similar what i had shown earlier for flux based methodology you have to enter the inputs in the second step uh, i am showing by a different color the difference corresponding to the coefficient of linear equation based methodology the flux based methodology was presented only for explicit method here the methodology is presented also for implicit method so as far as time step is concerned if you are using an implicit method you have the freedom that you can enter any value of time step so for an implicit method the solution algorithm involves you can enter any value of time step rather than using a stochastic method however if you want time wise accurate solution you have to use a very small value of delta t because this delta t also controls the temporal accuracy so in an implicit method uh, in this step you also need to calculate the coefficient of linear linear equation like a e w a p because this coefficients are used finally to calculate the temperature in single step and the third step is similar to what i had shown for the flux based methodology where you apply the initial condition and dirichlet boundary condition the fourth step is also similar where you apply the non dirichlet boundary condition the fifth step in the flux based methodology was a two step process and here it's a single step process where you where you solve the final linear linear equation a single equation uh for explicit and implicit method and note that for an implicit method for an implicit method use an iterative method for an implicit method with a convergence criteria which i had presented in the previous topic on iterative methods for the topic on essentials of numerical methods for cft so in any iterative method we basically compare the capital n here is representing the iteration number so this is a new iteration this is the previous iteration so let us suppose if you have five yellow circle for each yellow circles we compare the values between two consecutive iterations and pick the maximum difference that is so this is the convergence parameter that we use in any iterative method that was presented earlier and we check it for a convergence tolerance we note that in when you use an iterative method when you use, sorry when you use an implicit method since you have to use an iterative method there is an inner loop also so at each time step in an implicit method you have to use an iterative method like gauss seidel or jacobi iteration there are two loops in an iterative in an implicit method and this is the convergence tolerance corresponding to the inner loop corresponding to the iterations this is the convergence tolerance epsilon for the iterative method and other than this for the outer loop we have a steady state convergence tolerance so there are two tolerances which have prevented for this problem this is the stopping criteria which is same as i had presented earlier for flux based methodology and finally you have to check for the unsteadiness criteria if the unsteadiness is greater than 0 then you have to go to step 4 and continue your uh, time wise generating time wise data for the temperature distribution in your movie and if it has reached to steady state you can stop and then so you have to go to step 4 and when this is confirmed then you come out of this loop and plot the steady state temperature distribution and you can also do some post processing like numerical differentiation and numerical integration to calculate the a local conduction heat flux is and rate of heat transfer at the different points this is the uh, the uh, had shown you the 1d example problems for the flux based methodology but the 1d problems that i will present in here will be different in the flux based methodology i have taken the dirichlet boundary condition on both the wall where left wall was zero right wall was 100 here i am taking one of the boundary condition is there uh, other boundary condition is non dirichlet So here in this case, for this problem, which I am showing you, example problem, the left wall is 100, right wall you have a convective boundary condition, 
where basically left wall is 100 and the right so you see like a sheet whose left wall is 100 and the right wall is basically subjected to ambient condition and let's suppose there is a fan which is blowing here so the ambient temperature t infinity is 30 degrees centigrade and due to the force connection let us say the conductivity transfer coefficient is as large as 100 watt per meter square kelvin so for the so the, on the one side of the sheet, you have a blowing air which conductivity transfer coefficient and ambient temperature, you know. On the left side of the sheet, you have 100 degrees centigrade. Initial condition is taken as 30 degrees centigrade and you have first case where you have no heat generation. For this case, this is the temperature distribution. This is a no heat generation. So the point to note here is that for the non so we have a blue grid point here. Now this blue grid point, you can see that it is varying with respect to time. If this was 100 in the previous problem. In the previous problem, we have left for 0, right for 100. So the, for the digital boundary question, this boundary value is not valid. Whereas in this case, you can see that the boundary wall temperature is increasing slowly from 30 degrees centigrade and it has gone close to maybe greater than, slightly greater than 60 degrees centigrade. So note that whenever you have a non digital boundary condition which involves gradient, the boundary blue circle is a function of the border yellow circle. The border yellow circle is the part of the interior of the domain, which varies with time. And if the border yellow circle varies in the non digital boundary condition, the boundary point temperature evolves with time. So I showed you this animation. Later on, I have an example problem where I will show you through static pictures also. This was an example problem without heat generation. If you consider another problem with heat generation, the same problem, left wall 100 left wall of the sheet 100, right wall uh, subjected to convective boundary condition. Then now, since we have a heat generation, now in this case, now here again note that left wall is 100, so it is always 100. This value is not changing. Right wall, you have a non digital boundary condition. So the blue circle at the right wall is function of the border circle near the, and this is changing with respect to time. And finally, it reaches to a steady state, which is presented here. This is an example problem corresponding to 5.3 of the companion textbook, where uh, along with the, this example problem, the computer program is also presented. So this is corresponding to stainless steel sheet of one centimeter thickness. This will be shown for heat generation zero and 100 watt meter per cell. As compared to the previous problem, in this example problem, left wall is zero and right wall is subjected to a heated condition, 100 degree centigrade. And the conductivity transfer is 1000 watt per meter square Kelvin. Note that the boundary condition in this problem and the previous problem is different. So for this problem, this is the figure which is shown in the companion book, figure 5.15 for no heat generation and for heat generation. You can see for uh, non digital boundary condition on the right wall. Here again, there is an excellent agreement between the steady state analytical solution and the steady state numerical solution. For the problem where you have a non digital boundary condition. And so the solid line and the symbols, there is an excellent agreement. So this com confirms the code verification of the steady state temperature distribution. For the transient variation at, uh, let us say, the, uh, the 0, 2 delta T, 4 delta T, 10 delta T, 50 delta T, you can basically see that the right wall boundary wall temperature, the blue circle at the right wall, the temperature is varying with respect to time. It's starting from 30 degrees centigrade and gradually it is increasing. Okay, so this is for without heat generation. The blue circle value on the right wall increases a lot for heat generation, as shown. Finally, for 2D heat conduction, now in 2D we have north and south also, and this is the algebraic equation obtained from the coefficient form which was presented in the previous lecture on physical law based finite volume method. This is for an implicit method. Note that for an implicit method. In each equation, there are five unknowns because there are five temperatures which superscript 10 plus 1. The implementation details again uh, for an explicit method in the single step process. In each equation, you have only one unknown. So basically, you have to scroll to all the yellow circles, which is true to i max minus 1 and true to j max minus 1. So you use the coefficient of linear algebraic equation form of the equation. In the previous slide, what I have shown, and you basically substitute. Capital, while you are writing the program, you substitute capital E as i plus 1 comma j, w as i minus 1 comma j, n as i comma j plus 1, this is i comma j minus 1, this is i comma j. And uh, so this is presented in implementation detail. 
which I'm briefly presenting here. More detail you can find in the companion textbook. So this is the loop which you use to calculate the temperature, and more that uh, you, have, you can solve the equation independently for an explicit method. This is for an explicit method. Whereas the, so this A is for explicit method, this B is for implicit method. This also figure corresponding to the companion textbook. Now here you have to solve, as I said, in a 2D conduction, in a 2D case implicit method for conduction, unsteady state conduction. At, uh, here you have not more than five values. And it involves only one value from the previous picture that corresponds to the uh, respective grid point. This is P, so the same I comma J is taken from the previous. Okay, so this is the computation stencil for the implicit and this is for explicit. Where for implicit, know that you have to solve it iteratively because in each equation there are more than one answer. We have a system of coupled linear linear equation. Finally, uh, the solution algorithm for 2D I am not presenting separately. It's very similar to the that for 1D which I presented for explicit and implicit method earlier in this topic. And I'll be here presenting some couple of example problems. Let's suppose your left wall is uh, 100, bottom wall is insulated, right wall is constant, fixed top wall is conductive. Note that in the flux space methodology, all the boundary conditions were 100, 200, 300, 400. So they were Birchley boundary conditions. So in this methodology, I am showing you the all the various possible boundary conditions: insulated, constant, flux, and convective boundary. So for this methodology, I'm including the non boundary conditions. Let us suppose the initial condition this place is, plate is initially at 30 degrees centigrade. The boundary condition is such that left wall, it, the wall temperature is 100, bottom wall insulated, right wall constant heat flux values 10 kilowatt per meter square. The top wall convective boundary condition involves H equal to 100 watt per meter square per minute, and the ambient temperature is 30 degrees centigrade. This problem will be presented for two heat generation, no heat generation and 50 kilowatt per meter. I will show you animation for no heat generation case. This is an animation for the no heat generation case. Now here again note that uh, you should be clever enough to judge whether your result from this movie if you see, you should be able to judge whether these are uh, real world temperature distribution or this are, these are some, just some colorful uh, pictures which are uh, like artificial values. So one of the things to judge is that on the bottom wall, you have an insulated boundary condition. So when you are watching this movie, uh, you are from, if you know it's an insulated, you expect that dt by d by at the bottom wall is zero. So at the bottom wall, you can you should check that the isotherms which are hitting in your movie, temperature distribution, if they are hitting vertically at bottom wall, then you can, be, then you can at least be confident that you are not doing wrong. Whether you are doing right or not, it depends on many other things. But basically, these are some basic checks which you, which you should uh, understanding you should develop. And once you generate your data, you should watch this carefully to make sure that you are clever enough to judge what is what you should not get. Okay, so at least you should be able to know that this is not a garbage number distribution. On the right wall, it's a constant heat flux, so all the lines hitting in the right wall should hit heat at a not vertically, but at a constant angle, which will be decided by uh, minus Q W by K. So in this animations, you do see those, they are hitting at the same angle. So this also seems fine. Okay, so these are some of the basic checks which you should be able to do based on this understanding. Now here, this is the steady state temperature distribution for this problem. Here again, left wall is 100 and near to the bottom half of the uh, Bottom half of the left wall, you have temperature, this is 105, it's a no heat generation case. Between this 100 and the temperature is greater, greater than 100, less than 105. This wall is at 100, so on the bottom part of the left wall, the inside temperature is greater, so that you have an outward temperature, outward rate of heat transfer. On the upper uh, half of the upper portion of the left wall, the nearby temperature, this is 95, this is 100, so it is between 95 and 100, here the temperature is less, the rate of heat transfer will be inverse. So basically, by looking at this temperature distribution, you can get an idea of the direction of heat transfer. On this wall, it's a constant heat flux, on bottom wall is insulated, so you cannot expect any heat transfer. 
So the right wall, it's a, you can see uh, the temperature is gradually uh, reducing. So there is an inward heat flux rate of heat transfer as expected. On the top wall, it's a convective boundary condition and the heat is going out. This is the figure, corresp figure for corresponding to 5.18 from the companion. Therefore, uh, this is a steady state temperature distribution for no heat generation and for 50 watt kilowatt per meter cube. So with this, I had presented the uh, solution methodology, two different solution methodology. Flux-based solution methodology, where the solution method and the details are such that by writing the program, you use the physical quantities like heat fluxes, total heat gain by conduction, and volumetric heat generation. So I feel that for a beginner in programming, it makes much more sense to use physical quantity, and that is presented on relatively simpler uniform grid. However, you can extend this methodology for a non-uniform grid. However, I have, uh, but note that uh, the uh, flex-based methodology I presented here for explicit, methodolo explicit method, which is much more involved and complicated for implicit methodology, so you can ignore that. And for the, the second methodology that I presented, which is a single step methodology, which involves coefficient of linear linear equation. Uh, this is presented here, mainly discussed for non-uniform grid, but you can also use it for a uniform grid. And this is, you can use it for explicit method as well as for implicit method. However, you have certain, certain advantage in explicit method that you don't need a linear loop, but there is a price that you have to use a, a smaller time step, which is dictated by the stability criteria. So I have presented uh, the various step, uh, the detail, details for the methodology. This you can use to develop your own computer program and develop your own uh, C, uh, the software for uh, for unsteady state heat conduction in Cartesian coordinate system. This methodology is printed for Cartesian, but note that the same procedure you can ex easily extend it to cylindrical coordinate and spherical coordinate system and develop your software not only for Cartesian, but for cylindrical and spherical also. With this, I had come to the end of this lecture. The, you can find uh, more details, especially on the implementation details uh, in the chapter five of this companion book. And you can also download the supplementary materials, which involves the computer programs corresponding to the various example problems that I presented here, as well as the colored figures of so in the book is the black and white figures. So you can freely download the colored figures from this website. Thank you for that.